Exactly. Perfect. We're done. Great. And now back here. And we just start okay. presenting. That, that should be it. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Great. Wonderful. So um, okay. it's it's my pleasure to introduce Michel Hecht from, Hecht from the Mosaic Group, MPI, CBG, CSBD, and TU Dresden. So not really, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where you're getting your money from, but... <laughs> so, uh, Michel, Michel is now a regular here, so I'm very happy about this, that he, he's coming in again and presenting his progress on multivariate interpolation which will totally kill off AI in the long run and we won't need anything anymore than just this method. Or maybe at least we tell the ML guys how to use this. Really okay, for, really fine, that's fine. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, that, so so we're, we're not on the final fight. Oh. By the way, you can turn this off it, if it really bothers you. I'm just putting it on the yes. picture. So I think you can also just turn it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't expect you to. <laughs> Mathematicians is like that. <laughs> so I'm I'm very happy that that he has come. Unfortunately, uh, like like always, I have stuff on my list, so I will sneak out. Yeah. But one of the nice things is for your information also, and you finally have to sign something, we're, we're recording this for internal use and maybe later on also for external use, but then we will contact you again. Yeah. For our reference, for people who are out there and for people who couldn't join today to really have a look at your talk. And I'm very happy that you're here. And I give the stage to you now. Great. So thanks. Sorry for the delay. And um, yeah, it's fun to be here again. Um, and yeah, so I mean, that's the title. We want to interpolate functions in more than one variable, which is a crucial task. And um, I just can start. So I mean, a little introduction is, of course, that principle of science is that we somehow have to gain or generate or think about uh, models or theories and these with this in hand we can make predictions on what will happen or which phenomena should occur which then gives us a way of designing experiments for validation and then this loops back and makes models better and so on and the hope is that if you iterate this a while that your model becomes more and more better in your theory and you can actually really assert something and this is the successful story of science right but the problem of course is how do we get these models and um, of course there are uh, theories and um, people who really think about models in the other way uh, which of course can help is that you use data to derive these models. So let's talk about the simple data set you can think of. This is in one D. So you have one process, which can be a velocity, or it can be a concentration, or it can be a pressure, or whatever, an electric uh, charge, whatever you think of. And um, and what the only thing what we can do is we can measure this process or this function at, at certain points. It's all we can do. And from this, we somehow want to compute the whole function everywhere. We want to understand what's that, what's the building law, which, which uh, is behind that. OK, so how can we do that? So this, of course, goes back to one of the most incredible guys in science ever. And the other one. So, <laughs> um, and these guys um, understood that there are um, good algorithms of computing polynomials which um, interpolate this function. So that means I can compute a polynomial which really goes to these measured points, and then I hope. And this polynomial somehow is close to the function. And this is the point I come in a few slides. 
But first of all, is that these algorithms are really cool. So if you use the, the, the Newton scheme, and you have a quadratic runtime for computing the polynomial, and afterwards you can evaluate this polynomial everywhere in linear time. And you only need linear storage, which is your data, and that's it. And if you are a bit smarter, like Lagrange did later, and you fix your points, you say, I only matter at these points, and you can make uh, a bit math and find that everything becomes linear. Where do I see? Time. How do I see n squared and n? In the you have to compute the coefficients, right, of this polynomial. And this requires n squared operations if you do the Newton scheme. And it requires linear amount, linear complexity if you use the Lagrange screen, if you fix for your the measurements. Then you can pre-compute the so-called barycentrical weights, and with these weights, everything becomes linear. Yeah. And the other thing is that these algorithms are, if you implement them in a computer, they are numerically very stable and accurate. And there are no, no instabilities um, for them. Okay, fine. So now we have a way of uh, computing polynomials, but I mean, there are many functions, not all of them are polynomials. So how can this help? And um, Oh, there's another slide. Uh, so, okay, here's a bit more on the, on the algorithmic part of this, which is just a recapturing of, of classical theory. This is, you could do this naively by just writing down the one amount the matrix, uh, which gives you just, you have these points, you write uh, their exponents, yeah, the expressions uh, you would uh, get if you evaluate a polynomial on them. You have the values of the function f and However, and then you can have to solve this um, system of linear equations, and then you would find these coefficients. And if you do this in this naive sense, you would need cubic time, quadratic storage for holding the one the Monde matrix, and evaluation in this naive form also would be quadratic. Cubic, cubic time and runtime because I need to diagonalize? You need, you need to invert the matrix. Oh, invert. Okay. You can do it a bit faster than cubic, maybe 2.7, blah, blah. So in general, use Gauss elimination or inversion of West Russian or whatever. So, but it's, it costs a lot. But if evaluation is n square, like uh, I thought you already had the coefficients. Now you can. Now, now I give you a point x, and I want to have the value of the polynomial. Yeah. So, so I have to compute this sum, which is written there. Yes. So, and this is uh, uh, n squared operations. Because uh, I have the exponents. Ah, uh, okay. X to the n is n operations, and I have to do this yeah. more or less n times, which is n squared, at least in complexity. Okay. All right. Now, you can be smarter by changing the basis um, of this Van der Monde matrix. So, this Van der Monde matrix represents how the polynomial space. Um, can be or is this uh, transformed to, to, to the values of the function. So it's just, if you look at this, uh, C is V inverse F um, problem, then this links values in, in Rn plus one with, uh, with a polynomial uniquely. This is a linear map. Linear map is given as a, as a representation by a matrix. You can change the, 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 the basis of the, of the polynomial space to the Newton basis, which is just given by the products of uh, the derivatives so or the, the, the differences to the, to the metal points. And if you do so, then the matrix becomes different. Then the matrix becomes uh, lower triangular and has a very specific structure. And if you incorporate this now, then you can, all classical, then you can write down in recursive direct, uh, divided difference scheme, which computes you everything numerical stably in quadratic time, and also only needs linear storage, because you don't have to hold the whole matrix anymore. And if you are even smarter in some way as Lagrange, then you take another basis, which is the Lagrange basis, 
And this is a formula which just expresses that these Lagrange basis is one at the point pi and zero at all the other points. And in this case, you have then somehow already inverted the Vandermonde the -de matrix. And the interpolation in this sense becomes trivial and would be given just by the values of f times this Lagrange polynomial. And this is one at this point. So of course, it has to coincide with f and zero at all the others. And this is true for every one of them. So the, the interpolation is just given by that. And this then, is doable because the Lagrange, the LIs are by themselves more complex? Is that the reason? Now that's the structure of the LIs. The, the LI is only one in PI and zero everywhere else. This is true for everyone. So LJ is all, is all the other L, LJs are zero here. So if I want to coincide with F, the coefficient of this polynomial has to be F at this point. Um, it's, yeah. Is it like uh, the autonomy basis? It's not autonomy. Okay. But an autonomy, okay. It's just, um, it's, which I come later, you can think of it's a, it's a discretization or approximation of the uh, Dirac distribution. Oh, okay. And one at this point, I zero everywhere else. I want to express the function with that, and it's just the value at this times the function, which is in this case the Lagrange polynomial, plus the function somewhere else times this function, and so on. And here the crucial step is just so the interpolation is trivial, but now if I want to evaluate this guy somewhere, then I have to evaluate the Lagrange polynomials. And therefore, I have to have somehow a formula for them, which allows fast evaluation. And by rewriting this formula smart in this barycentrical form, given that these WI, which are these so-called barycentrical weights, are given, you can evaluate in linear time. Right. So now we have efficient interpolation schemes in 1D that can compute a function, a polynomial given, given interpolation data. And as I said, of course, there are many functions which are no polynomials, which are more complicated, which are even non-analytically. That means their Taylor, uh, Taylor series does not converge on the whole domain. So, I mean, what's the motivation to, to do this? And of course, there's the much older uh, Weierstrass theorem, which says that in principle, every continuous function can be interpolated by polynomials. And uh, not interpolated, I'm sorry, approximated. So, but the, the, the crucial question is, how do we compute these polynomials? And the Weierstrass theorem just says, it's more or less just an existence theorem and constructive versions are given by the, the, the Bernstein uh, reformulation. But these polynomials which occur there, they don't have to coincide with the function at all. They maybe are just close. In principle, they are given by, by uh, projecting uh, the function to, to, in the L2 sense, because you make the integral and ask what's, what's the same in the, in the L2 sense. But these polynomials, which you can get from this theorem, are not interpolating. Maybe they, they coincide in a few points, but they don't have to coincide in all the interpolation points. Right? And this has a disadvantage, namely that you only get a linear conversion to the function in general. So, in spite of very strong conditions on S, this won't work on practice. So you can say, okay, if if this Firestrass approximation is that slow, can we maybe be faster if we interpolate the function? Questions? Is this for only for 1D or like? This is, we are still in 1D, 1D. I just recapture classical theory. Okay. So this is just 1D. Okay. So, and now if you interpolate, then there occurs the room phenomena, which is misleadingly often termed overfitting. And um, 
but how to reserve. So, so the, the thing is, if you really interpolate the function, now if you really say I require that the polynomial runs through exactly through my data, then it's proven that for every distribution of measurements, there is a continuous function which will divert away from your polynomial interpolation. The other way around is interpolant will diverge away from that. So that means there is no, no set of points, no distribution you can get, such that you have a universal scheme that really can approximate all continuous functions. It's not possible. So that's the bad news. The other thing is, which I would say, so the, the term overfitting is in somehow misleading used because what people do is they have a certain set of measures and they somehow recognize, okay, if I, if I enlarge the degree of my polynomial, I get fluctuations. So they balance the degree. They say, okay, I just try to, to don't make this degree too high and then I just want to um, hamper these, uh, these fluctuations. But this is, this is not really, this is how to say, this should be not true. So the, 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 the point is, if such a thing occurs, then it's not really the, the cause of, of overfitting, it's the cause of you have methodically wrong or you, you have used the data wrong. So the answer is, um, there's, a, there's a classical estimate which says, if I have the function and I interpolate the, the polynomial, then the, the error I can have depends on the n plus one of the derivative times this product and divided by uh, this uh, n plus one faculty factor. And now you could ask, okay, I maybe don't really have control on, on the n plus one of the derivative. But what I can try to do is I can try to minimize this product. And if I minimize this product, then the classical answer is, if I use, for instance, structure of nodes of second kind or of first kind, well, here just like the second kind because they are crucial for some other things, then this really becomes small. And there are other distributions also of points that also make this product small. And um, this then means that you can derive for, for good, for proper choices of, of, the, of the nodes, you get that the difference between the function and the interpolant is really bounded by a strongly uh, 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 increasing, uh, decreasing uh, bound. So that means as long as the n plus one derivative does not grow faster than two to the n times n plus one faculty, you will catch it. These, uh Theta x point yeah. is such, just an arbitrary point in the domain. Which yeah, it comes, when you, yeah, it comes from a recursive mean value theory mm -hmm. and it's just an unknown but existing point. Okay. And um, this can be translated in the, in the statement that, that you can approximate in principle by interpolation not all continuous functions but all continuous Zobolev functions. Zobolev functions, we don't know them really, are these, these functions which are, have, have weak derivatives in the weak sense. Maybe you thought of this. So PDEs are formulated with respect to, to Zobolev functions. And, uh, and the space of continuous Zobolev functions is the largest Hilbert space contained in the space of continuous functions. So in this sense, it's a generic class of functions you can approximate if you use interpolation. So far, so good. And the other thing is that if you now require a bit more on the function, then these rates will be fast and ideally exponential. Um, the de definition of the uh, weak uh, derivative was what again that you can throw at, uh, that you can throw the derivatives at a test function was that correct? Or? Yes. So okay. the, the integral of f times the derivative of a test function has to exist for every test function. Okay. Yeah. So in a test function, it's a smooth function of finite or compact support. 
All right. So far, so good. And this was a, it's a, it's a great success, which was used for many computations. And uh, in the 40s and 50s, here is in this high speed computer room. And um, this is great. And uh, um, most of, of results, data analysis, and so on, are based on these algorithms. And now, of course, the question is, how can we extend them to higher dimensions? And the first thing we have to talk a bit about is uh, the notion of gradient for, for multi-dimensions, because that's not as canonical as in 1D. So first of all, if you, if you look at um, the set of, if you want to describe the exponents of a, of a polynomial in 1D, then you just have numbers one to the n. If you want to do this in, in multi-dimensions, you have, you have um, of course, multi-indices. You have, I want to have quadratic in x, cubic in y, to the four in c, whatever. So, and I can describe this, of course, as an as a integer vector. Right? Okay. And then I can exactly look at the polynomial space, which is given as a span of all these monomials. So x to the alpha is just given by x to the alpha one times x to the alpha two, and so on. All right? So these are all terms and mixture monomials I consider. Yeah. Uh, the pin one, is that just the usual norm you take because you are not in a vector space here, you are in n to the power m? Uh, is that just the p norm as you would expect it in R? Or? It's just the classical okay. p norm, L p norm. Okay. This is, uh, as it is written here, you just sum oh, up oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> just sum up to the power of p, and the p is on the other side, you would then take the, 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 the p root of that. Okay? And if you look at this and you consider in the, in the canonical basis, you consider uh, polynomials which um, look like that. For every multi-index, you get a coefficient and times somehow a certain monomial, right? And now how you use this A as a crucial um, meaning for, for these spaces. So for example, if you say, I want to have that, uh, um, I consider degree three with respect to P equals one, then I sum up just the, the entries of alpha. This means in this case, I would get two plus two, which is four. This guy is not smaller than three. So this monomial would not be in the space of a one degree three in two dimensions. All right. So four is bigger than n, it's not bounded by, by, by three, so this is not a lot. If I use the uh, two degree, then I get two squared plus two squared, which is a squared, and the square root of this is smaller than nine, which is three. So in this case, it would be allowed. And if I take an infinity degree, then I can take the n everywhere. Right. All right, so that's a bit notation and, and definition of these spaces. Um, and I don't want to annoy you with notation in a simple form. You can now write down the multivariate on the Monde matrix in this form. And um, yeah, it's just index gymnastics. And now the question is if you, you recall, and in principle, um, we want to solve this, this type of equation, this linear equation. We want to invert this matrix, and then we get the coefficients of the, of the polynomial. But now the question is, how do we choose points such that this, so the, yes, here this would be PA, how to choose these points such this matrix becomes not only mathematically, but also numerically invertible. And this is what we call unisolvent nodes. And um, the problem, this problem was not solved so far in a, in a feasible fashion. The only thing you know is if you take the uh, infinity degree, then you can take a complete grid, for instance, an equidistant regular grid, and this will be unisolvent. 
But as soon as you say, I don't consider an infinity degree, I make my eight, for instance, to be the AM and P, so with respect to N1 degree or a two degree, you don't know how to assign points to the space such that this matrix at least becomes mathematically invertible. And you can rephrase the question in the sense that if you would have a non-trivial solution of this, it means we times c is zero. This would be the coefficients of a polynomial which completely vanishes on all your points. Right? And this, in other terms, would say that this polynomial defines a hypersurface, some algebraic variety, such that all the points are sitting on this variety. And thereby the question is, how can we ensure that our points are chosen that smart, that there exists no hypersurface, which can be given by a polynomial, which is allowed to be in the space we consider, that runs for all these points? Okay. Assume we would have these nodes. Then the next question is, can these nodes be structured in a way that we can stably and efficiently invert this matrix similar to the, to the Newton scheme in 1D. You don't want to invert this whole big matrix with a, with a cubic scheme because then you will be lost for already small instances. And in addition, as I asserted, so we have to, to, to choose these points smart to ensure convergence to functions so that this is meaningful what I compute with that. These points have, a pro have to have a property that a generic class of functions can be approximated with good rates, highly exponential rates. And this, in addition, which is not written here, um, as another thing, we want the number of these points to be not too large. We want that these points have cardinality, which at least only depends sub exponentially on the dimension which means we resist the curse of dimensionality. If I, if I use an infinity degree, then the number of points scales with n to the n, n to dimension. So I will be lost already in small dimensions. So we have to find points which have these three properties and scale reasonable with dimension. All right. And we found them, that's the good news. <laughs> Um, as I said, this is the reformulation of this condition on unisolvents that there is no hypersurface running through these points or no polynomial which can vanish on all of them. And if we choose them properly, we get an approximation again for all subordinate functions. This is just a generalization of this statement. And if these are trepidant functions, which I can assert later, this means they are analytically, are functions which are analytic on a certain subdomain, then these rates will be exponential, or we reach at least by validation the optimal exponential rate, which is proven in Trefton's theorem. So you can't be better. So we reach the optimal conversions which you can hope for. And these schemes remain maintain the, the numerical efficiency or the efficiency and the numerical stability of the Newton interpolation and the Lagrange interpolation schemes in one. Great. So, um, to give a bit this, an idea how these, these guys are formulated is that you choose for every dimension, you choose a set of points. CO2n, is now, these are n plus one points. And then if you have an alpha, which uh, an R, which is given by all these multi-indices, you generate a certain grid, which just says if I have alpha three in the first coordinate, then I take the, the, fir uh, the third point of the, of the uh, P1. 
And if I have a two in the second, then take the, the, the second entry of two and so on. And um, which is crucial is if you take PI as the layer ordered chemical grid, then everything works. So to give you a visualization, so in 2D, these grids for a two degree would look like that. So you see it's an unregular grid, which has holes. In some sense, it's sparse. And then in 3D, you would see if I have uh, several planes, and these planes become sparser and sparser. But they are arranged in a way that a sparse plane is close to a, to a fully occupied or very much occupied plane. As it is in 2D, if I have a sparse, it's not so good seen here, but if I have a sparse, for instance, these yellow guys, then the blue and the, and the orange guys are more occupied than the, the yellow guys, and they are close to them. So this is a very good distribution of these sets. And um, if you look in L2, is the difference between L1 degree and L2 degrees, so a total degree where you just sum up in the L2 degree, then this is visualized here. So you have the L1 degree are all the yellow guys. And in some sense, we take a few more, which is the L2 guys, which are allowed now. And this is also was. Uh, so Yannick, a student which I supervise, has uh, worked a lot on finding these points, uh, helped with that. And what we, what we see is, so Trafford, uh, Trafford, this is the guy who made chat fun, the chat fun package, right? Uh, proved that if you take a one degree, then your conversions rate can't be as good as if you take an infinity degree, and if you uh, take a two degree, it can. It does not. It, it does not have to. This is not stable in the theorem. This is the, the other direction. This is open. But it's clear that if you take a one degree, then your convergence rate will be not as good as if you take an infinity degree. And if you take a, a two a, a degree, it possibly can. And the thing is that while the the number of L2 nodes is larger as the number of L1 nodes, but the rate, if you reach the optimum, is much faster, also with increasing dimension, it's better to choose more points to get a better rate than to choose less points with a smaller rate. And this is what we do. Um, here, I'll give you the result of um, benchmarks of our algorithm with several others. First of all, so, so the, our approach with a two degree is the red guy here, and the yellow guy is with respect to a one degree, and so we may cover the same picture as in the, in the plot before, right? We get more or less this, this uh, convergence rate for a one degree, and we get the Red one, if we take uh, a two. The blue guy here is again chat fun, and the uh, yellow guy with the diamonds is uh, an R package which uses, which is similar to that, and uh, uses championship nodes of first kind. Now, all the other important plots are given either by spline interpolations linear splines, cubic splines, or fifth order splines, and by floater hormon uh, uh, interpolation, which uses rational functions, so quotients of, of polynomials as interpolants. And there is, yes, the, the upper guy is the naive approach by inverting the one to matrix. And this is, as you see, not stable. It's numerically not stable. The, 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 the arrow you see, you see here is not caused by the choice of the wrong nodes. The nodes are the same, but it's caused because you can't invert this matrix if you just use a general scheme. So the nodes are same, the number of node points and the position of nodes are same. The nodes for, for taking the one the approach or this uh, uh, red approach are the same. I'm the same, okay. The difference is here just caused by, by numerical instability. 
you can you can interpolate with the naive one the model approach only small degrees up to whatever 20 or 50. After this, you're lost. Okay, this is 2D. This is 3D. So we just uh, let out here, don't plot the infeasible methods. So we see that float of hormone interpolation is better if you want to have, in a certain sense, uh, acceptable rough picture, let's say 10 to the minus 7 or whatever accuracy, you will reach it fast with this method. If you ask for machine precision, then only Chef Fun, the other Chevy Chef guy, or our approach is feasible. How does Chef Fun differ from yours? Is it uh, evaluation time or or is it just an alternative? Chef Fun uses uh, a tensorial uh, interpolation and thereby the whole uh, L infinity grid. All, all approach, uh, approaches here, despite our approach, use L infinity degree, while we use really the L2 degree. This means we really use less points and are compatible, or slightly better. And in higher dimension, this becomes even more visible. So here you see the, the amount of points which we need and in, 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 in 3D, you don't see really a big difference. The difference between L2 degree and L infinity degree is not that large. The number of, of, of points you need for that. But if you go to 4D, then something happens. So in 4D, we, we consider two, I have not said what, which function we fit, right? So the, the function we, we, we look at is the, is the Runge function. The Runge function is known to cause the wrong phenomena. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the wrong function is a function which is non analytically on the whole domain. You can't write it in a, in a Taylor series, but it's analytically on the so called traffic domain. And we know. We know the, the for the wrong function, I come later to this, uh, we know the road. We know this guy. And additionally to, to that we are so compatible and so on, we really have fitted the rate and we recover exactly this row. We, we cover exactly the optimal convergence, which we which is optimal. We can't be, be better than that. Okay, now come to 4D again here. So what we have, the problem here in this benchmark is that for the Runge function, if I take uh, factor 10 here, which is more uh, varying than, than factor 1, the spline approaches and so on uh, um, can't go beyond degree 80. And till this point, we see not a big a big difference. In this scale, they are somehow compatible, flow to Holman is a bit better in the beginning, and so on. But in the previous, uh, in dimension three, we had um, approximations till degree 120 or 150 computers, right? And also for current limitations of the implementation of the algorithm and so on, we said, okay, let's simulate what happens if we make the function easier, or which would be a uh, scale into the hierarchy. Yeah. If I change, change the factor here from, from uh, 10 to 1, it just would be either I zoom in or I make the function simpler. And if we do this, then we see that the only methods which, uh, which, which um, benefit from the simplification are the R package, tap found in our approach. So all the others are, so the, 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 the field guys are with respect to factor 10. And the non filled or the other way around. The field guys are the simple ones with factor one, and the non filled are the benchmarks with uh, factor 10. And you see that they are not benefiting from the simplification. Okay. Quick question. I, I'm now confused about the, four, the, the dimensionality of the problem. So this is dimension four. So x is four dimensional. Yes. Okay. And now what we see that we reach machine precision already four degree 41 or something and the other guy needs 47 and if you now compare what this is uh, 
gives you on, on data reduction, then we are at a factor of six. And if we go to dimension five, then this continues. And we here now get even a better accuracy by, by two magnitudes. And again, a factor of six reduction at this point. So I don't say that all problems are solved, but I say that this algorithm, even if it has to be proved in, from an engineering, from, from, from an implementation point of view, it resists the curse of dimensionality most. So we have a chance here for, for computing functions, for non-analytical high valuing functions in a reasonable amount of time or reasonable amount of data. And which I have not talked about yet because this is not really uh, implemented now. So of course the question in these dimensions, um, let's say till six, which is important for, for phase spaces of 3D uh, systems, we can still work with, with decomposition, smart adaptive decompositions. Uh, where the function is varying much, we take higher degree or decompose the domain again. And this reflects this benefit here. This means if we, if we in addition, have good adaptation of the uh, uh, decomposition, then we have, can, can gain a lot of improvement to, to the other methods at the moment where with spline manipulation or something, you have no chance. Yeah. So you were saying um, the scaling with respect to storage evaluation runtime is linear? And how does this change with the dimensionality? So you increase your number of nodes, right? As you increase the dimensionality, is that then? So, so the, we come to this point later. The, okay. the algorithm used for, for these benchmarks has a quadratic runtime in the number of interpolation nodes for computing the polynomial and can evaluate the polynomial once given in linear time. Um, and now the point is that, of course, if I go to higher dimensions, the number of nodes becomes more and more and more, but it does not um, increase exponentially. It increases sub-exponentially, which means polynomial, but I have no bound on the polynomial. So, I mean, okay. So, but let's, let's state it like this. The number of nodes with respect to infinity degree, so all the other approaches uses, divided by the number we use for um, n to infinity goes to zero and also for dimension to infinity goes to zero. So it, it's similar as the L infinity ball, which is the volume of the, of the hypercube in n dimensions, which is two to the m divided by the, uh, or related to the L2 ball. And the volume of the L2 ball divided by the volume of the uh, L infinity ball converges to zero. And this is how these things scale. So that there is no explicit formula for how many nodes you need with, with amen with, with degree two, it's only known for an infinity degree and for total degrees of all ball. P equals one. Then you, you can you have mathematically formulas, and the other one can approximate. All right. So uh, what I wanted to say here, I want to say a, a bit uh, of, of what's, yeah, what's the underlying math of that. So so all this space somehow on a, on a field of which is here just written a bit abstractly and uh, just uh, uh, copy pasted uh, from from the latest paper. Uh, in the train now, um, but um, so it's, it's all based on a splitting, which I just want to try to assert on this uh, slide. It means what we do is we have the n-dimensional problem with degree n, and we choose a hyperplane H1, which is then of co-dimension one, so dimension reduces. And if we can solve this problem, so either find nodes here or find a function or find an interponent of this problem here. And on the other side, we make the degree less. We keep the dimension, but we, we reduce the degree and we solve this problem. 
then we can combine two these two problems to, to solve the remain the, the, the original problem. And if I do this recursively, then what I end up is either zero degree problems, so constant problems, which are easy. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I mean, well, the constant function I know if I know it at one point, or zero dimensional problems, which is which are also easy. Zero dimensional is I have a function on one point, yeah, I know it if I have a node. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and if you use this recursive scheme of all the things I told you, then you get this generalization of the divided difference scheme and the quadratic recursive algorithm that computes everything nicely. So, so this theorem is on tells you how to choose the the polynomials. No, no. This theorem tells me that I can decom that I can split the interpolation problem and in a quite abstract way. And if I look at this concrete, then I, so I have a lot of choices how to realize this, which then allows to answer all the other questions. Can I choose, first question is, can I choose this splitting in a way that the algorithm which computes the interpolant becomes numerically fast and stable? I can. This is, this is, so there is a much more general notion of how I could choose the nodes accordingly to, to this recursive splitting, but they would not allow to efficiently compute the interpolant. They would need more time, they would be not that stable. Then in addition, I have to ask, can these nodes, if I choose them, there's still a lot of freedom if I take these structured nodes. Can I choose them such that I know that I convert fast to almost all functions? And also this is incorporated. And this is, I can't assert in a, let's say, this talk here, but I just want to give you an intuition how what's, what's, what's belief is beyond this, whatever, behind, behind. And a nice thing which rephrases this is that if you now want to relate the, the, the different kinds of bases, you have the Lagrange basis, which is again, I'm one at this one point and zero everywhere else. You have the Newton basis, which is the generalization of the Newton basis I taught you in, in 1D. And you have the canonical basis, which is just the monomials, x to the alpha. And you want to relate them all to, to, to each other, because each of them has certain benefits. Um, then this is the theorem which does this, and the nice thing is that the transformation matrices between them are all triangular. And some of them have to be computed with respect in, uh, to cubic time, but the crucial ones even can be computed by this recursive scheme in quadratic time. And these things, these matrices, do not depend on the function. They only depend on the choice of your nodes. And what is not explored yet, but what is the big project next, these, these uh, triangular metrics are even more structured than only triangular. They are recursively triangular. That means the triangular submatrix consists again of triangular matrices accordingly to this splitting. And if you incorporate all this, which is the plan, then there should be two results that namely, we get a generalization not only of Lagrange and Newton interpolation, but also of biocentrical Lagrange interpolation, which gives you not linear, but n or a times log a performance. And now there's a course the famous algorithm of which can interpolate something of n times uh, log n performance, which is FFT, fast Fourier transforms. And in 1D, there's a classical alternative, which is called trigonometric Lagrange interpolation. So instead of using the discrete Fourier transform in 1D, you can also do Lagrange interpolation with respect to trigonometric polynomials. 
and it's the same thing. But so far, nobody knows how to extend. And I just claim here that this approach, if you uh, rephrase it with respect to trigonometric polynomials, can give you an alternative to, to a fast Fourier transform with, with the same complexity. And as in general, if you use the upper form, the, the benefit here, the function don't has to be periodic. For, for Fourier transform, the function has to be periodic. And if you have both, you can combine and you can think of how can I solve one of the very crucial problems, namely how can I do FFTs of non-periodic high varying signals. Which for instance occurs if you have to decompose as Klaus has to, if, if the data is that heavy, that you can't do one global FFT, but you have to decompose the data because then you lose the periodicity. So, but this is just in this sense outlook of what what can be made by this by this approach. Um, let's talk what's already more concrete. And this is uh, uh, what we have discussed with Ashin a bit. Is how can this help for 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 and which is somehow related to the to the project of the PhD project Jörg has uh, uh, applied for. Um, is can we use this now for, for level set problems, for problems if we don't are on the, on the flat hypercube, but we are on some curved, let's in this sense, simple, keep a two dimensional surface in 3D. And if we look at the torus, the torus is given um, as the level set of a fourth order polynomial. Okay, you have squares here, here's a square, and here's some squares. So this is a fourth order polynomial. All right. So if I put points, regardless of how many, on the torus, then they all sit on a hyper surface of degree four. All right. Hyper surface of degree two would, for instance, be the sphere. Right. Okay. This means they can never be unisolved. Now, this is the definition. If I have, if there is always a polynomial which vanishes on them completely, then they can't be unisolved. So I can ask the doing question, can I compute this polynomial? And this is, yes, you can. And this is what we did here in this experiment. We just put it um, enough points on the torus I guess, if I recall it, uh, less than twice the number uh, I would need, 1.5 or one, whatever. And just from this data, it's all I know, I recover this polynomial with machine position. And once given this polynomial, I can, in some sense, analytically derive the gradient. And there's still a lot of room for improvement. This is just somehow naively done here, but indicates, okay, I get degraded also with machine precision. And now I'm in business. I have to call the gradient corresponds to the surface null and allows me to, to derive uh, covariant derivatives. I know what is tangent and what is normal. And then I can use this to, to compute curvatures, compute curls, compute whatever I want. For all these dynamical systems on on, on, uh, on that but, but then uh, you added more points than you did for unisolvents. Yes, but they are also zero on the zero level set, right? They are all zero. Then, level, yeah, of course. <laughs> so so regardless of how many I put in there, if, if they are all on, on a hypersurface, then then there will always be a polynomial which vanishes in them. That's that's a dual notion. Notion of unisolvents is the points are distributed. There is no polynomial which can vanish on them of a certain point. The dual notion is there is one which always okay. vanishes on them regardless how many they are. Okay. Yeah. Um, right hand side graph. Your error has still an error there. Is this just a maximum and minimum error? Wait, 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 wait. The right side now asks the following question. The right side is now assume I have a function which is given on the whole domain. 
can I fit or interpolate the restriction of this function to the unknown level set? So what we put here in is we put the analytical Lange function on the whole domain and ask, can I, from the data which I have here, compute the function which results if I restrict this function to the unknown level set? And this is the error which occurs here with increasing degree, and this is uh, just a, a mean max min error plot for, I guess, 10 iterations for each degree. Because so the, the iteration comes here because we just distribute these points randomly to show that for random data or whatever, it is, which just comes from a diffusion process or whatever, you have a good chance for, for finding these functions. Okay. This is cool. Now, the other cool project which I do together with Uwe is use this to, to get new schemes for, for efficient numerical integration. So we have these Lagrange polynomials, which are, as I said, they can be considered as approximations of the direct function. So one at one point, zero at all the other. And the interpolation becomes trivial with respect to them, right? So if I want to integrate a certain function, then I can approximate it by the integral of the polynomial. Which means I just have to know what's the integral of the Lagrange polynomials, which we then call weights. This here, so we can compute these guys again up to improvements we will make with machine precision. This is a cubic formula. This means this will be correct when M R F is a, is a polynomial. There's no approximation if F is a polynomial. Then it's true. Okay. Now the smart thing which we have to further exploit is um, extend the notion of orthogonal polynomials which one knows from 1D. And there's a famous Gauss quadrature which says I can compute a degree 2n or 2 plus n plus 1, I always mix up, polynomial by, by knowing only half of the nodes I would need to interpolate the polynomial, which is based on the orthogonal regential polynomials, maybe we heard of that. And what we, what I understood recently, better than at the moment, at the, as the prototype is running at the moment, that we can do this even better. So to what is, what is tried to explain here is you have the L infinity degree. This is the set of all indices, okay, which scale exponentially with dimension. Here, this is the L2 ball, which approximates, as I showed you, as a, a, every function as if I would take the whole thing. And to compute, so the, 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 the gray region, if I just sample a region here, or accordingly to, to points generated by, by these indices, and accordingly to, to points um, generated by indices of uh, much less k, then one can prove that this formula will be correct for the whole gray region. And this is much, much less than just taking what is usually done, the 2k um, or n half, which is not here, the n half um, of this L infinity grid, where you use tensorial weights, which you usually use. So in other words, the plots I show you next uh, will become better in a few days, weeks. So this is just First, or some benchmarks uh, which, which from, the, from the prototype, uh, which uh, mainly uh, Uber uh, developed, um, which is just, OSSEAL is just uh, a nasty function, and um, we benchmark several methods here. So, quasi uh, uh, Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo methods and classical cubic formulas, which are known, and 
adaptive to which are formulas caught from the Python package and so on. And what we see is we are quite good. We are so this we are the, the, the green or the blue guys, and we reach a very good accuracy, um, better than the under methods. Here, for, for this region, there are no uh, cubital formulas known anymore for these degrees. And uh, the red one is not plotted here, but anyhow. So this is work in progress. I just want to this all just say that um, this will be cool. So this is really promising. This is we're on the right track. And the thing is, which might become so the, the project where we're yours also working on this. Can we extend this integration method also to integration on curved surfaces? So if we combine this with this level set method here, then we also can integrate very efficiently and stably on curved surfaces. And maybe then later also on curved submanifolds of phase spaces, which represent something we want to know. Okay. And the other cool thing is, uh, which is a joint work with Christian Müller, uh, and which is Yannick working on is global optimization. So what we do here, uh, mostly it's designed for hyperparameter tuning of, of machine learning schemes. It means you have a deep neural net which will solve a certain problem. In this case, it's a surrogate model online LD8. Don't ask me what this is. It's just some standard of health stuff. And um, the question is, how can I construct my deep neural net such that it performs best? And the problem is, in this, for this problem, is we don't want to sample the function which estimates how good the performance of my concrete net is that much, because this requires each time you have this net, you have to somehow estimate the performance by, by doing it a while. Uh, and then this you say, okay, it performs like this. And then the question is, you have some hyperparameter, how many layers, uh, which rates, blah, 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 uh, what you can do. And what we do here is we fit, so we, 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 we Use a polynomial to fit this hyperparameter loss function. Use on this then known polynomial a classical Bayesian, uh, Bayesian inference improvement model by incorporating the analytical gradient which we compute. So, usually, Bayesian inference is just a sample method. Yeah, you have you can say, okay, I expect that in this region, the uncertainty is very high and the chance for getting a better value than I've seen is very high, so I sample there. And this is somehow a discretization of a adapted gradient descent. So you can never really compute this gradient. But we have the polynomial. We do implicitly write down an adapted gradient descent that incorporates this idea. And this is the outcome of the prototype now, which is a 3D problem already now, four and 5D problems work on a laptop. And they are better than um, these classical alternatives like particle swarm or Poisson tree and so on. So here the dimension is the number of hyperparameters. Yes. Okay. In this case, it's three. And this approach on, does not only apply for, for hyperparameter tuning for ML, it applies for general global optimization. As for instance, um, this project also with Nico together, um, reconstructing of, of um, electron densities. So I'm not a physicist, you have to ask him. But uh, the, the, with Max, I don't know who of you knows Max from ATL, who's a you are Max? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the thing we should try to apply to your problem. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Great. And the other cool thing is, which I work together with Nico mostly is uh, to develop um, regression methods uh, by, by the notion of this scheme. And so this 
who, who probably will become an alternative to PTE learning by deep nets. So we don't use a machine learning approach to learn the solution of a PDE, we regress the solution. And in the special case where the PDE is a linear PDE, we have we can we can fit the Green's function. So the Green's function is a ground solution of, of the PDE, which if you have it, you only have to convolve with your initial data and your boundary condition in your plan. And of course, also the question is can we extend these things then to, to curved surfaces and so on. So there's a lot of, of, of play doors which, which open for playgrounds here. And, um, and of course, I'm happy to, to work with you and whomever on things <laughs> for once. And, um, and of course, also it gives you new, new ways of, of, of handling complicated boundary conditions. The principal idea for, for boundary conditions is that you can you can you can somehow take this grid to be only occupied near the boundary. Forget about the, the other guys in the middle. Fit fit a polynomial to that. This approximates your function on the boundary. Subtract it, then it becomes periodic zero everywhere on the boundary, then you can use FFT or you can use then this other methods and so on. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff, I guess. Ah, there's one more movie. It's the regression for, for higher dimensional data. So assume you have a function, you want to know what's that function. You want to know what's, what's the correlation of that. Keep it simple for the moment, let's say a function is three-dimensional, has three values, or four. And you can consider the graph of the function, which is the point x and its value trace, okay? This is one dimension higher. This is somehow a subsurface of your n-dimensional space. It's a graph. In, in, in 1D, it's, it's a, sub, a co-dimension one of 2D, and this is what you always draw. And it could be something like this. It could be a torus, it could be a sphere, it could be something more complicated. And you could use our level set method to um, identify it, to find an equation which takes the variable x and the variable, so the value of f of this is a polynomial and says then this becomes zero. This means you have certain expressions in F and certain expressions in X and they together are zero. And thereby, you can try to, to, to find the correlations. You can try to relax it or you can try to, to separate it and see what are my independent variables. Because in higher dimensional regression, it's usually the, 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 the case. You have a 10 dimensional space, but actually the, the, the correlations can be expressed by only four dimensions. And to find them, this is given by, if you have this equation, then you have a starting point, then you can start finding them. Okay. You're saying with this method, you can find the points, uh, which is the hypersurface, which is zero. Like I can I find the law of the hypersurface, and the law of the hypersurface tells me how the, uh, so the coordinates of the X are the variables of F, how they are correlated to each other, and to F. So in the simplest case, if this is something like F of X is separated from them completely, it's just a linear term, F of X equals, and then you have X blah, 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 and F would be a polynomial. But now you get an equation like F squared times X1 equals X squared to the blah, 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 blah. Then it's still something you can handle quite well. You see? Just, just yeah. a question, how is the Q something different from zero than the zero vector? Because if you put something else into as a, a, as a zero vector into the first argument, which is the vector x, yeah. you can get the zero vector. It's, I'm just a bit confused, how does that tell you? Yeah, for all these points, it's always zero. But put in this, this, that is. 
is my Q. This is my QG now. Yeah. For any point here, this becomes zero. Oh, okay. So it's not trivial. Okay, so with this, I say thank you very much. If you like, I sent you the latest paper uh, or version of the paper which was submitted on Monday. Um, hopefully, it will be published. And um, I say thanks a lot. Thank you, Michael, for your uh, enlightening talk. Uh, there are some room for questions, I think. So, um, I have two questions about uh, which stem from classical interpolation theory. And um, you first showed this theorem about the upper bound of the interpolation error in yeah. Mondi. Yeah. And, uh, did you form? Uh, sorry, if I missed it, did you formulate uh, analogous theorem to that? Yes. More than that. So where it is? So well, here it is. Right. So this formula here. A generalization of this I uh, approved and wrote down for any dimension. Oh, okay. But in any dimension, it's not that uh, so so it's not that easy to 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 uh, oh, this is the formula, right? Mm -hmm. These are the Newton polynomial of of uh, degree of the full thing degree n plus one, and then you have this term here, and you can write down a similar thing in any dimension. What is not true anymore is that you get this nice estimate if you put in these Chevy Chap nodes. And here has to be the first kind. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Anyhow, um, because the, the Chevy Chap nodes of second kind are the extremas of the Chevy Chap nodes of first kind, so the, of, for, for the polynomials. And this then gives you this classical estimate two to the n here. And this case, this is lost. What is really the, the, the big thing, and which is a bit hard to tell that this is a big thing is already, this is already a specific, uh, specification of the classical result to, to, to ask which functions can I approximate by interpolation at all, regardless of how fast, what, what's, what's the space, what's the best I can do. And all of this, in, usually in 1D you say, okay, if the function is, which is continue, continuous, if it's differentiable, blah, blah, blah. So already there is, it's a, Weaker assumption to say you only have to be a continuous software function. And this, this result maintains true if you extend it to arbitrary dimensions. And the thing, a bit, uh, the, 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 the disadvantage of this guy here is that you usually don't have control on, 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 on this derivative here. But the cool thing is if you, if you now have a, have a notion of, of this rate, right? So you don't know what the function is, but you know that if the function is somehow nice, not analytically, high value, but somehow nice, then this rate should apply. So what you can do is, in your interpolation scheme, you can start um, interpolating and then use a classical test approach or something, so on the other dates, try to estimating your rate. And with this, you have a chance, if you see at first, does it exponentially decrease? And if it does, you can try to fit it and then you can somehow estimate how much further I have to go until I reach the accuracy I want. Okay. Yeah. And my second question was related to the interpolation scheme. So as, uh, if you go back to the slide where you present the Newton, uh, uh, not interpolation scheme, uh, the quadrature scheme, sorry. Um, ah, okay. uh, if you go forward. So if I remember correctly from my numerics courses, the, um, the, uh, yeah. the way you construct the uh, coefficients from the Lagrange polynomials give you an uh, optimal error for approximating any integral. Is that correct? Well, so, so, so there are two things. So quadrature formulas are said to be, what's the term there, I forgot. Well posed if they are exact for polynomials. Yes, yeah. Okay, so this is what I mean. So if you do this, and f is a polynomial, then this approximation disappears, it becomes an equal sign. 
Yeah. Oh, and you can. Um, okay. Uh, and the uh, degree. Uh, so you, um, I, th I think I, I meant that you need the least amount of uh, coefficients exactly. there. Okay. In one D, the, the famous Gauss quadrature tells I have a polynomial of degree two m. And if I'm smart, then I assemble it only on n points for n plus one. And I then there will be a formula with respect to well chosen Lacan's polynomials or polynomials, Legendre polynomials, such that this will be exact. It means you need you need only half of the data to, to make a curvature uh, or a quadrature exact. And this is of course cool because you can you can hope that that uh, uh, somehow the, the, the function is included then in this higher space, right? Polynomials. And these Legendre nodes, uh, which correspond to the Legendre polynomials, they are also very good interpolators, so uh, approximators. So the, if you use them, then you will have a good approximation for functions. And then in addition, you, you don't have to sample the function whole, only roughly speaking half of the data you, you, you would need to, to really fit the polynomial, only half of them you have to sample, and then you have a nice formula here, and that gives you this integral. And this also, so you're also needing the n dimensional inter, uh, quadrature scheme now, a uh, lot less nodes. Yes. Okay. So, this somehow, so what, 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 what's here in progress is, of course, this benefit, if you can somehow, you can not completely canonical, but if you can somehow maintain this through dimensions, then this not only adds up, yeah, so it becomes the, 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 the the amount of, of, of what you what you can gain on improvement of this becomes more and more and more. So this is conversely saying you have a chance of lifting the curse of dimensionality. You don't. We have a quadrature scheme which does not scale exponentially with dimension for for getting good quadratures. Or a very broad class of functions. Okay. I had a question uh, regarding. More the applications. Yeah. So when we think about the application of this scheme, multivariate interpolation to optimization problems. Yes. Right. So there is this. This is this. Yeah. For example, this. Yeah. So there is this uh, three n dimensional problem that some of us care about the Schrodinger equation. Yes. And I'm working with Nico. Yes, yes, but I'm aiming at something else. I'm aiming hey, at sorry, I'm um, just, just but, um, So it's that equation, exactly. And, but then it's not in terms of machine learning, but in general, when you solve the Schrodinger equation numerically, yeah. you basically, one way to do this is to find the optimal wave function. Right? Yeah. So it's an optimization problem, three and dimensional. Okay. So, and the Common method nowadays is uh, quantum Monte Carlo, like Monte Carlo sampling. Yeah. So how? I'm trying to understand how, and I'm not sure if you could answer how. How does this? How would that relate to this? So if I now want to use this multivariate interpolation yeah. to optimize the wave function that minimizes basically that Schrodinger equation, okay. how how would that? Is there, do you have an idea how that would scale compared to a Monte Carlo sampling? So, I mean, I'm not working with Schrodinger equation. The last time I really worked with them was 10 years ago in my physics course. But, um, I mean, like, is that a I possible alternative? With, so, so there, I mean, the question is, so. Let's maybe let me do it from, 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 from another side. Here, we do somehow a similar thing as Bayesian inference. And if you, so as I understand, what you do is something similar. I want to cover something, a sample somewhere where I expect uh, uh, I get the most uh, data or the best data again, and by this I can optimize uh, my weight function, right? Yeah. Usual thing. So here two, two, two things we do. First of all, the nodes on which we sample are at least partially given by these grids I showed you. 
And on the other thing, we use the analytical gradient we have. So for the loss function you have there, we can again, one approach would be to fit again these loss functions, which tells you how good your wave function is. And use this approach, this global optimization approach to find, to make an optimization on the wave function. The question is how many parameters you need to describe the wave function. If it's not 200, but maybe 10, we have a chance. The other way is, as I said, is um, to go directly into the equation and try to at least partially uh, find the Green's function. For instance, so in the Schrodinger equation, you have the Laplace operator in it. If, and of course, you know analytically the Green's function for the, for the Laplace operator for certain problems and so on. But what you, what you really could try here for your specific setup, for your specific initial data, and of course, also through the coupling of the, of the other terms, is to, to use this approach to, to fit or to compute the, 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 the polynomial approximation of the Green's function. And this then simplifies the whole equation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe and maybe if the equation would be linear, so there are some Schrodinger equation types which are linear. Yeah. And this should work out perfectly. If it's not linear, then it becomes more complicated, but I mean, step by step. Mm -hmm. This also applied to not border Green's functions then? What? To not border Green's functions? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Maybe discuss it. Deeper, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to find out what the, the doing correlation. Is there any other question? Uh, just one last question. So this idea of unisolve in nodes. Uh, so these are a set of points where you can sample, and that's enough. That that's what you're saying. Enough to construct the fault. We construct the fault now. Yes. If you know the values of these points. Yes. Uh, that, that, so this matters on what kind of polynomial you're taking. So the specific polynomial you're dealing with. Right? Like if you, for some other polynomial, you, you may need some other set of unisolvent nodes. Uh, the ones you showed here for, are for uh, the Runge polynomial. So, uh, so I mean, should... not, not this one. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot something. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, uh, earlier in like a uh, smaller example for 2D, you showed the uh, Set of unisolvent nodes. Yes. So that would change if, depending on what kind of function you are dealing with. No, no. So the, the set of nodes. That's in I would say that you can't prove that this is optimal. This is optimal, okay. For any kind of function, so any kind of like. Then you can't not prove what, you, what, what we see is they are very good. Okay. So they seem to be almost optimal. So the point is just. So I try to, to, to say that even if you have this theorem which tells you uh, how to construct unisolvent nodes at all, which just guarantee the polynomial I fit to this is uniquely determined by, by this data, then there are all these other questions. I want to approximate fast, I want to have this, this numerical scheme, is robust fast, and so on. This is a lot of, of additional requirements on the whole population problem. Yeah. And these nodes seem turn out to be very cool. You can, there are millions of other patterns, distributions, blah, 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 you, you can do. And this is partially also what, what we will do. So that it's quite flexible, okay. which allows uh, complex surfaces and, and also to, uh, to, 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 as I said, Think about adaptive decomposition or adaptive basis. Adaptive. So there's a lot. You're not forced to on this. And they are very good. Okay. But you also can play around. Free. <laughs> and, um, so, but but uh, the point is usually you don't know what the function is you consider. Yeah. And it turns out uh, this becomes quite universal. This can catch more, almost more <laughs> but, but then I would wonder what's special about these points. Like, uh, I mean, wh why would you? There should be something special about these points that you, if you sample these ones correctly, then you get the function. You can represent the function. That's, the, that's the theorems in the paper. Yeah. So. That's the math which I omitted okay. here. Okay. So there are theorems which prove that if you take 
as I said, the, the, the most delicate, but from my perspective, really fun, fundamental statement is that um, oh, this gun is that you, if you use these nodes, <laughs> then you can approximate all of these functions in principle, and if this function is a bit more than just Sobolev, it is a bit nice, then the rate will be fast. This is, this is not just, we propose this, this is proven and this is somehow proven. Okay. It's at least proven that it can't be better. So if you reach it uh, by, by numerical validation, then this gives a lot of evidence on that we do the right thing. And this theorem here also might give a, it's a way of the delivering a proof of the, of the open problem here, namely asking whether these rates really apply or not, because this is open. Thank you. Okay, then uh, let's thank Michael again, I think. Yeah, thank you. most important thing. Oh, it's gone. Oh, hey, so you need this apple sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? By record, I thought it was off. It's recorded. Thank you. It does. Yeah. So record button. Stop recording. Yep.